Well, uh, hello and welcome to this forum uh, that uh, we've arranged today to talk about um, 5G and telecommunications towers. My name's Julian Lisa, I'm the federal member for Barara. Um, and uh, this forum, this webinar has been put on as a result of a promise I made to people in Glenhaven who are concerned about um, uh, 5G and a proposed telecommunications tower. Um, today, uh, I'm joined by Dr. Sarah Loughran. Uh, Dr. Loughran is the Electromagnetic Energy Director at the Australian Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Agency. Uh, that is the body that effectively sets the standards uh, for what is safe in relation to uh, radiation protection in Australia. Um, so Dr. Loughran, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, uh, just letting people know who are watching this, um, we've asked people to submit their questions uh, in advance and we'll be going through those questions. And this webinar will be recorded and uh, will remain on the, on the web for people to see, to help them understand some of the issues in relation to um, 5G and telecommunications issues. So uh, Dr Loughran, I wondered if we might just start telling us a little bit about your background and experience and your qualifications in this area. Um, yeah, sure. So uh, I've been a researcher in this area for um, about 20 years. Uh, I started off uh, doing my doctorate uh, in cognitive neuroscience, where I investigated the effects of mobile phone-like radiation on brain activity and on our sleep patterns. And from there, I went and did um, some postdoctoral studies for five years in Switzerland, where I did a whole range of uh, studies looking at uh, basically health effects of electromagnetic energy. And following that, um, I worked in Australia at the University of Wollongong until recently, where I was doing similar research. Um, as part of this as well, I sit on a number of international panels and committees. So I uh, am part of the World Health Organization's Environmental Health Criterion uh, task force. So that's looking at the health effects of electromagnetic energy, radio frequency specifically um, on a number of different things. So I, I sit on that. And I'm also uh, a scientific expert group member at the International Commission for Non-Ionising Radiation Protection. Um, and this is the body that has just recently released the new guidelines uh, looking at safe levels of uh, radio frequency or radio waves. Thanks, Dr. Lockman. So we've got a person here who is um, a, a clear expert um, in, in, the, uh, in the issue of uh, electromagnetic energy and electromagnetic radiation. Just tell us a little bit about PANSA's role and what sort of relationship our PANSA has to the government and to telecommunications companies. Yeah, so um, our PANSA is an agency of the Australian Commonwealth Government and we're the primary authority on radiation protection and nuclear safety. So we protect people in the environment from the harmful effects of radiation and we also regulate Commonwealth entities using radiation. We undertake research, we provide services and we promote national uniformity and international best practice across all jurisdictions. So in summary, you're the federal government's expert independent authority on radiation issues. Yes. Um, I've got to ask you this. Have you ever worked for a telecommunications company? No, I never have. Do you own any shares in, a, in any telecommunications companies? No, I certainly do not. <laughs> have any interest in the, in the tower at Glen Haven? Um, no, I'm based in Victoria, so very far away. Um, I want to also understand, can the Minister for Telecommunications or, or any minister um, or anyone from a telco direct you to argue against scientific findings that you may have made? No, they can't. And in my experience in the last 20 years being in this field, I've actually never had anybody, whether it be um, from an Australian telco, a government or any other telco, um, direct me not to uh, talk about my findings. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Now, I, I thought we've, we've established who you are and, and your independence. I wanted to talk a little bit about electromagnetic energy and electromagnetic radiation. Can you, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, what that is and what are some of the concerns that people have had about it? What are the health risks relating to electromagnetic radiation? Yep, so I prepared um, a few slides for this. So I might share my screen so that I can talk through it so that we have some visuals uh, as well. So if I just do that and oops, I'm just going to share my screen. Here we Perfect. Are. Okay, 
So um, as I make this into a full, perfect. Um, so just to start off with, to give a little bit of a background about 5G itself, because this is sort of the issue that, um, or the new technology that's brought this up again as, as a bit of an issue. So it's the next generation in mobile phone technology. And what you can see from this chart is that we've had um, a lot of different uh, iterations of, of uh, mobile phone technology, right back to Maxwell Smart and his shoe phone that we all wanted at one point. And then in the 80s, we had the first generation of mobile phone come out. And from there, the sort of more modern generations have come out you know, reasonably frequently. And in 2019, we had um, the first launch and announcement of 5G. But the one thing that's important to remember is that 5G is a brand name and it's not a particular physical quantity. And so what I mean by that is that 5G and all the other wireless telecommunications, such as previous mobile phone generations and radio, television, um, they emit what's known as radio waves, um, also called radio frequency electromagnetic radiation, um, EMR or EME. So um, we tend to use those terms interchangeably, but they're the same thing. So what you can see is that mobile phones and TV and radio sit in this part of the spectrum, which is known as non-ionizing radiation. And we have other types of radiation in um, our environment and in society, things that we're all familiar with, like X-rays and other radioactive sources and even visible light, and they're deemed ionizing radiation. So it might sound a little bit technical, but I'm just going to explain um, the importance um, of this and if, you know, are radio waves harmful? So as I mentioned, radio waves are what we call non-ionizing radiation. And what that means is that they don't have enough energy to break chemical bonds or damage our DNA or our cells in our body. That's the, one of the main differences between ion, non-ionizing and ionizing radiation. So we need to understand that these types of technologies that we're talking about, like 5G, sit in this non-ionizing radiation category. If we have radio waves, though, at sufficiently high levels um, that they can heat our biological tissue or our bodies, um, and that can potentially cause damage to us. So things like a microwave oven, we know really heats things up. So if we were to sit in a microwave oven, that would be quite harmful and damaging to us. So lucky they're not big enough for us to actually fit into, I suppose. And then we have the radio waves from telecommunications and they are too low to produce significant heating. So we certainly can't you know, cook an egg with our mobile phone or do anything like that. Um, and they can't increase our body temperature. So they, they are non-ionizing radiation and the power that they emit is too low to cause any kind of significant heating that we know can cause damage. So what level of radio waves are we exposed to? So we have something at our Panzer known as the Australian Standard. It's actually the new one has just been released, RPSS1 at the end of February. And basically it's a level that we set, a safety level in which uh, all exposures should fall under that we, we know are safe. So in terms of, um, we did a study a few years ago looking at uh, these levels and doing some measurements. And what we found was that in terms of typical exposure to radio waves, if we're talking about Wi-Fi, it was about 100 million times below what this uh, Australian standard or the safety limit we set is. The measurements show that TV was more than 3 million times below the safety standard level. Mobile phones were more than 500,000 times below the safety level. And radio was 50,000 times below this level. So we have this safety level. And as you can see from these measurements that what our devices are actually uh, producing and what we're exposed to is well, well below what we know uh, is safe. I think the second important thing to point out about the safety level that uh, we set at our Panzer is that it's also a conservative level. So it's set um, and where effects occur are actually 50 times above this safety level. So we have a level up here where we know harm occurs. We take that down 50 times and then we set our safety standard. And then what we see is the things that we actually use in our, in our everyday lives um, don't even approach uh, this safety standard. So there's a lot of precaution built into this safety standard and in our environment, we're not exceeding these levels. 
So how do we protect the public? Obviously, we have this safety standard, which is intended to protect the public, and it covers the entire radio wave range, including the current frequencies that the 5G systems will use and the future frequencies that 5G uh, are intended to be using. It's our standard, our safety standard is based on scientific evidence and it's in line with international guidelines and international best practice. And we continue to review the science into this issue. So even though we've just set our new safety standard, we're continually reviewing the science as it comes in and wouldn't hesitate to change uh, anything if we were to see something of concern. So I've just got at the end here a little bit, some commonly asked questions that we get to address uh, some of the concerns that uh, the public tends to have. So one I think that's particularly pertinent to the reason that we're here today is whether EME exposure from telecommunications and other sources is more harmful to children. And so what we know is that the Arpanza safety standard that we've set that deems what all of these devices are allowed to emit protects everyone and that includes children, that includes pregnant women, the elderly or those that may be sick. So these safety standards are all inclusive and everyone uh, is protected under these. Another question again is, is a mobile tower, as close, if it's closer to my home or a children's school for instance, are we or are they more at risk of harm? And I think the important thing to point out here here is that the safety standard specifies limits of human exposure to radio waves to prevent adverse effects. So if you look at this picture here and we see that we have cars parked here and we have a height barrier, it doesn't matter how close to the height barrier these cars come, if they proceed underneath it, they will not be damaged. And it's the same kind of thing with our safety standards. It doesn't matter how far away or close um, an exposure comes to the safety standard, if it's below, then it's deemed to be safe. So again, radio wave exposure, provided it's below the limits of the standard, no harm will occur. And a big one of recent times is about 5G. Is it new? Well, it is new. And how can we be confident in the research? So what I can tell you is that there have been thousands of scientific studies that have looked at whether the low level um, power emitted by the uh, technology such as 5G and telecommunications in general cause long term health effects. And these have included studies on our human body cells, studies on animals and studies on human populations and from the total of this uh, research there's been no substantiated evidence of any health effects from radio waves at levels that sit below the limits of the ARPANSA standard. And I think another question we get quite often is, okay, that you've said there's a lot of science, but how do you assess the available science? And I think there's a number of important considerations um, when we assess the evidence and the science um, that are really important. So you can't just take one study on its own. And the things that we use to evaluate the science to come up with our standards and our safety limits are the quality of the studies. So it doesn't matter how many studies are out there, the quality is vitally important. So you could have 100 low quality studies that wouldn't really inform uh, what we do. So we need to ensure that the studies that are included in our setting of safety limits are of high quality. It's also important to see if the results are replicated or have they been reproduced? So in science, it's very important that we don't just take one single result and run with that and suggest that that's real and that's an effect. You need to be able to show that this effect um, is robust and that it can be replicated or reproduced by other independent scientists in other laboratories with high quality um, protocols. It's also important to look across a different, um, the different types of studies. So like I mentioned, there's lots of studies looking at ourselves, at animals, um, human studies, as well as epidemiological type studies. And all of these types or streams of science tell us something a little bit different. So to get a com more complete picture, we need to be able to look at the results that all of these studies bring to the table. Also, it's important um, to be able to see if there's an identified mechanism and by mechanism that's a, you know, how is an effect happening or how does one thing affect another thing. 
Um, so in, the, in this case, we would want to know how is the exposure to a radio wave causing the health effect that's being claimed. And one other important element of assessing the science is looking for dose response. So basically what that means is if we increase the exposure, is there more risk or do we see more effects? So all of these uh, aspects go into how we evaluate the science to come up with the answers that we come up with uh, when we're setting safety limits and when we're giving advice um, in general. So that's just a little bit of an overview of what EME is and, and how we work at our Panzer. And um, I'm happy to take uh, further questions, Julian. Well, thanks, Dr. Lockgren, for, for that presentation. Um, that's very helpful. Now, um, I, I'm going to put a series of questions to you that have been put to me in correspondence or that uh, uh, our community has, uh, has sent to me in, uh, in recent days. I should say for full disclosure that I've sent those questions to Dr. Lockwood in advance, so she's had a chance to have a look at them. Um, so let's start with the issue of children, because this is the one that is being um, raised most often here in Glenhaven. Does EME have a, an effect on children, particularly young children who may not have had their skulls fully developed and their bodies are growing rapidly? Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned, um, we have the safety standard that sets the safety limits. So these limits are set well below any levels at which harm is known to occur, and that includes children. Had there been I, any... Sorry, go on. No, you go. <laughs> Had there been any particular studies on children not to four years, particularly these the children that might be in, attending the childcare centre? Yeah, so there has been a lot of research done that involves children generally across different ages. Um, and there's also been a significant amount of work um, that looks at how children might absorb these radio waves differently uh, to adults. Um, and there are some subtle differences. And again, if we go back to the diagram I showed of the standard, because we do have some subtle differences, that's uh, particularly, you know, one of the reasons why this, you know, huge safety factor of setting the standard 50 times below where we know any effects would occur, would occur is done because that gives us um, you know, the assurance that even if there was populations that were slightly more sensitive, whether that be children or the elderly or, or infirm, that we have a huge um, safety factor built in uh, to account for that. What about the fact that here we've got children that will expo be exposed to the tower five days a week? Is there any research which categorically concludes there's no risk to young children being exposed to the tower all day for five days a week? I think what's important, important to point out here is that science can never categorically conclude anything, whether it be this topic or anything else we're talking about. So that's not how science works. What science does is it gathers information and all of the evidence that provides us with the likelihood of something occurring, or in this case, the likelihood of there being health effects from the exposure to electromagnetic energy. And so what we know is that from the extensive science that has been done, there is no indication of uh, health effects from this type of exposure. Now, there's obviously a significant amount of electromagnetic radiation existing in our city atmosphere right now. If we defer the installation, will the children have less radiation as they move around Sydney in general? No, so I think a common misperception of, um, or misconception about 5G is that it's going to operate at higher frequencies. That's not the misconception. It is going to operate at higher frequencies. Um, but the misconception is that those higher frequencies equal higher exposures. And that's not the case. So just because we're using different frequencies, the exposures are not going to be higher. I should just say here, I, I am asking questions not, to, not prompted by me, but they are questions largely in the language of um, uh, my community who, uh, who, who want to have some answers to this. So uh, I am uh, I'm, as it were, just, uh, just their voice by putting some of these questions to you. One of the issues that's been recently uh, repeatedly raised is that the New South Wales Department of Education has a policy that says no tower should be within 500 metres of a school. Why should a childcare centre be different? That's a question I'm asked all the time. Um, well, yeah, I, again, we have to return to the scientific evidence and there isn't any evidence to suggest that any facility, whether it be a school or a childcare centre or, or our office building, um, 
should be any different in terms of health and safety. So, so there isn't any evidence, you know, behind making different distances for different types of uh, facilities when it comes to effects on health. So th there's some suggestion that they should move the tower to 300 metres away from the childcare centre. What difference would that make to the safety of the children? None. So, you know, um, as there's no established evidence um, of health impacts from the EME from these towers, as long as the placement and positioning of the tower complies with regulations, then there'll be no difference in regards to the safety for the children. Um, I've, uh, this is a quote from, uh, um, from a constituent. Our Panzer report, they say, for the site states that the EME level within 50 metres of the tower will be 9.7% of the public exposure level. What does that mean for the health risks of children attending a centre 25 metres away? Yeah, so I think this comes back to the, the picture I showed before and what I discussed about the safety limits. So it doesn't really matter whether your um, level is at 1% of the safety limit or at 99% of the safety limit. As long as you're below the safety limit, then there's no known health effects and that's deemed to be safe. If the proposed Telstra Tower does go ahead, can premises nearby, especially the child care centre, be screened to shield them from any EMR coming at high intensity being so close to the source of the EMR? So I guess that's something we would call a precautionary measure to sort of shield or screen a, a premise. And um, this wouldn't be necessary because, as I've said, if there's no evidence of, of harm from the tower, then it's not something that would be necessary to do to go ahead and um, shield or screen or not something that we would advise. Um, this is another question from a, a, a constituent. The International EMF Scientist Appeal collectively requests children and pregnant women be protected and safe zones be established, such as early learning centres and schools. Why would they say that there wasn't a risk? Well, I think, you know, there are a lot of similar statements out there. And um, unfortunately, these statements uh, tend to be based on fears and precaution, and they're not based on the science. So um, when, we, when we look at the science, these precautionary measures don't need to be taken because as I said, the safety standards and limits already take into account um, the, the whole population. So children, pregnant women, like uh, you've just mentioned, are already covered by our safety limits. So I want to move from the question of children to some questions about 5G now. Um, 5G is new, you've, you've said it's new yourself. Um, how confident can we be in the research? Uh, how can we know its long-term effect now? So yeah, 5G might be new or 5G itself might be new, but the radio waves that we use for 5G or that are used for 5G, they're not new. So in fact, they're already used in a number of different ways in our society. So things like sec security screening at airports, police radar guns, remote sensors, and some medical devices are already using these types of radio waves. So I think that's the important point that 5G might uh, be new, but not the way the radio waves that it's using. Um, so they've already been used extensively in other things. And there's also an extensive amount of uh, global research that has been done in, to, in terms of radio waves and whether they have associated um, health impacts and, and there has been no evidence um, of harm associated with these types of exposures. Um, a constituent's referred to a thing called the Department of Communications Act. It states that 5G must pr protect the safety of persons, property and the environment. Um, how can this be the case if the tower proceeds at this location? Yeah, so um, this question is not something that uh, we deal with at our Panzer. But as you mentioned, you sent these questions to us previously. And so um, I got into contact with the Department of Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Communications to um, provide an answer. And um, I can let you know that they um, did provide an answer to this and said that the Australian government's policy is that all people in Australia should be able to access modern telecommunication services, regardless of where they live or do business. And often this means that new telecommunication facilities need to be installed to provide those services. Um, they also said that when rolling out low impact uh, facilities that the telecommunications companies have to act in accordance with a number of conditions to ensure facilities are installed safely, including following good engineering practices and interfering as little as practicable with the landowner's use of the land. Um, there's some specific uh, 
things when it comes to approvals for freestanding towers or, or poles. Um, so a freestanding pole or tower is not a low impact facility and it is subject to the planning arrangements, but this is at the state and territory level and not dealt with at the, um, the Commonwealth level. Um, and in New South Wales, uh, which is relevant for this forum, new freestanding towers of the kind proposed to be installed in Glenhaven generally fall under the state environment planning policy um, and carriers, including Telstra, are required to follow the processes for community and local government consultations that are set out in the planning scheme. Thanks, Dr Loughran. So I want to move to some of the health risks in relation to 5G that have been raised. People have raised cancer, but it's not the only health risk. Uh, one person told us of uh, children on the street all ending up with tinnitus and hearing loss and compensation being paid to them because of it. Um, are there health, is, is cancer a health concern and are there other health concerns other than cancer? So there are a lot of health concerns uh, in the public, cancer being one of them, but there are many others um, that we uh, hear about you know, on a regular basis that people are concerned are related to exposures from electromagnetic energy. Um, but as I mentioned previously, these concerns are unfounded and there's no evidence that these kind of health effects or symptoms are related to EME exposure in any way. I want to put a quote to you from S. Foster, a US um, advisor on electromagnetic radiation. Uh, the quote says, and, and, and I quote, no safe level of 5G millimeter wave radiation uh, has been established. There have been no tests of 5G exposure 24 seven on animals or humans. And there's no health and safety division of the Federal Communications Commission. And I should just interpose that's an American regulatory body, not an Australian regulatory body. Yet our health and society safety has been entrusted to the FCC. What would you say to that quote, Dr. Lockwood? Um, yeah, so obviously it is a little bit more American based, but I think the answer is the same in general. So like I mentioned earlier, science can never give us 100% certainty of anything. But what it can do is, you know, tell us the likelihood of something. And there's been a very large amount of research that's been done in this area, looking at radio waves and the health impacts that they might have on our health. And in addition to that, we also have extensive information on how radio waves interact with our body. So we know that the only substantiated health effect comes from heating, like I showed in the slides before, if we have significant heating. And we also know that these types of telecommunications technologies, the low power that they use isn't able to cause significant heating. So we have a mechanism that we understand and we know that these devices aren't able to produce that mechanism. And we also have an extensive amount of research that has not been able to establish uh, any health effects from these exposures. Now, um, this uh, has been a, a repeated question that I've had in the community, and it's comparing uh, asbestosis to issues arising out of 5G. And uh, uh, the question is, our history of asbestos shows that we can think something is safe and many years later find out that it isn't. Um, why will this be different? Yeah, and I think we've uh, in the past had quite a lot of historical comparisons like this one made. So why is this different now? And um, generally, these are not useful comparisons because science has progressed a long way since, um, since then and since a lot of the other comparisons that are made. And like I've said a few times, we have a substantial amount of global scientific research on this issue now and no evidence of a health impact. And that wasn't the case for these historical uh, type substances that we now know uh, do have health impacts. Thank you for that. Uh, now, just to show that uh, that, that I am putting uh, all questions, uh, whether um, difficult or easy, including ones to me, I, I have a question here for me. So are Telstra donating to fund my campaign for this tower? And look, I should say the answer to that is no. And I should just restate that uh, um, I've been fighting Telstra because their service to our community is appalling and I will keep fighting them for them to, deliver, for them to deliver better telecommunications um, for our community. Um, I should restate that I don't care where the tower goes, but I've had significant representations over the years that I've been the Member of Parliament, that there is an issue in relation to mobile phone reception in the Glenhaven and Dural areas. Um, and that's why um, I was pleased to see that they're doing something to address this. 
The precise location is not a issue, an issue to me. The reason why I've had this forum is because there've been lots of questions about these issues that we're discussing with Dr. Lachlan today. Uh, and I'm uh, very grateful for Dr. Lachlan's time uh, in helping us um, answer some of these questions as uh, one of the leading national experts um, from the independent uh, regulator. Now, um, there's a few more questions for Dr. Lachlan. We're gonna move now to compliance with standards and monitoring. Um, so Dr. Lachlan, if the tower goes up, how is compliance with the Arpanza standards enforced? So similar to before, this um, question sort of falls out of Arpanza's responsibilities. So I've had um, the department send through a response. And um, what I can tell you from, from them is that the Australian Communications and Media Authority or ACMA sets the rules for communications industries to follow. So these rules require that the levels of EME emitted by radio communications and telecommunications network equipment and facilities must be below the maximum limit that is set out in the Arpanza standard that I've been talking about. Um, and uh, ACMA will be updating its regulations in light of the release of our new standard at Arpanza and more information about this uh, regulation is available on the ACMA website. Um, and the department provides an overview of the regulation and safety of EME from telecommunications facilities, including information about 5G and Commonwealth legislation. And this can be found at um, the website www.eme.gov.au. Um, have you ever had reason to be concerned about a tower years after it was erected? And have any towers ever been pulled down because of health concerns? And I should say, not just the towers, but obviously the cells on, on, on them, or cells um, around the place. Yeah, so no, I've, I've never had any reason uh, to be concerned. And, and um, there's been no towers or cells or infrastructure pulled down based on substantiated health concerns that I'm aware of in Australia. Thank you. Um, now, uh, here's a question from a retired engineer. Um, and I say, is monitoring of the towers properly done? Um, this um, retired engineer with an electronics, electrical engineering and computer science background says, I've done some of my own research using a basic electromagnetic radiation tester and found that it, in at least two instances, the tester has indicated uh, quote unquote unsafe levels of electric magnetic field radiation where the public is impacted. Do you want to say anything about that? And the yeah. proper for monitoring of the towers? Yeah, so it's it's not our role at our Panzer to monitor the towers. Um, ACMA, that I mentioned before, are responsible for checking that the EME levels are below the maximum public exposure levels set out in the standard. And what ACMA have indicated is that these measurements are generally substantially below the safe levels set out in the our Panzer standard. Um, but if you wanted further information about that, or if you had an issue with that, then it would be ACMA that you would contact regarding that. Um, got a couple more questions. Now we're going to look at the methods that uh, you and our Panzer use. Um, under what authority does our Panzer exist and advise the public regarding wireless technologies? Um, what's your primary source of data that empirical evidence regarding wireless technologies and EMF slash EMR safety and impact is based upon? Yeah, so like I mentioned before that um, we're an agency of the Australian government and we're the primary authority on radiation protection and nuclear safety. And we use best international practice such as the World Health Organization and the International Commission for Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection along with our own internal expertise and assessments in order to develop our uh, products like our safety standard and our other advisory materials. Thank you. Now, I'm just going to, uh, to ask you to excuse me because I've got to read quite a long question here, but I think, um, you know, in fairness to the person who's put the question, I'd like to put it in, in their words um, in order that you can uh, that you can hear it. And it also uh, demonstrates to my community that um, I've put questions that people have asked um, uh, our community. So let, let, let me read it to you. Uh, and please bear with me because it is a long question. Why does a to continue to rely solely on the ICNIRP for setting maximum radio frequency radiation exposure guidelines in Australia. Uh, this is a small NGO based in Germany with very limited biomedical qualifications on their 15 member committee. Uh, they're not a health agency and widely reported to have close links to industry and possible conflicts of interest. And they put a citation there. Uh, this organization continues to promote uh, maximum RFR exposure, industry guidelines based outdated thermal effects only despite a review in 2020. 
This organisation continues to disregard over 1,800 scientific peer-reviewed studies which document biological effects and a range of serious health implications at levels well below current thermal effect levels. In 2011, the World Health Organization International Agency for Research on Cancer classified radiofrequency radiation as a possible group 2B carcinogen. While the findings of epidemiological studies have been debated, a recent review of such studies is unequivocal and states that mobile phone radiation causes brain tumours and should be classified as a probable human carcinogen 2A, by the WHO's IARC. A majority of scientists conclude that it would it should be reclassified with strong arguments being put forward from various scientists for RFR to be a group one human carcinogen, another citation. The cause effect relationship between RFR and cancers in animals is demonstrated in the finding of clear evidence of carcinogenity in animals due to RFR exposure in the recent US National Toxicology RFR, RFEMF program and Ramanzini Institute studies. Scientists and medical practitioners are concerned about significant risks to the public, and over 400 have signed and appealed to this effect in 2020. Despite this, our PANSA continues to rely on the ICNIRP and a small handful of scientists adhering to a policy of ignoring the significant body of scientific and biomedical research and scientific community calls for a precautionary approach with a comprehensive review urgently required of a maximum exposure limit. Please explain why. And again, I just reiterate to people I've given that question in, in writing to Dr. Lockland, so she's had a chance to, to think about it uh, and to consider the questions raised. Dr. Lockland. Um, yeah, so, so it is a long one, but um, our PANSA's safety standard is based on best international practice. So while this includes ICNERP that's been mentioned you know, heavily in, in uh, that question, um, as well as others, we also independently review the science in order to come up with the safety standards and the best advice for Australia. Um, and I think it's important to come back to what I mentioned before about how science is evaluated here. So certainly, um, like was mentioned in the question, there are um, other people who uh, don't see the science um, effects as, as we evaluate them, but you really have to be careful um, in taking a, a piece of work and taking it as gospel. You need to go through all of those steps that I mentioned, looking at the quality of the science, how robust is the result, how re reproducible is it, um, how was the study performed, a whole range of things before you can actually evaluate the results that somebody is presenting. And that indeed is what we do at our PANSA. And that's how we come up with the safety standards and limits that we set and the advice that we give to the Australian public. Dr. Lockwin, I'd just like to ask you uh, to go over a couple of things that we covered uh, earlier in the, in the piece, and I'll, I might in a moment also get you to, to put the slide pack back up. But before we do, can you just restate your qualifications again? Um, there's been some commentary about uh, about your qualifications on Facebook, and I just want you to restate them again, uh, again for the benefit of people watching. Yep, so I, I have a doctorate in cognitive neuroscience um, coming from, I have a double degree in biology and psychology before that. Um, and from that point, I did my postdoctoral studies in, in Switzerland and uh, then was an associate professor at the University of Wollongong before uh, beginning uh, at our PANSA last year as their EME program director. So you've got some biomedical and uh, biological uh, qualifications there in, in the yes. work. Thank you for, for uh, um, uh, underscoring that. Look, I wondered if we might go back to the presentation, if that's possible, because I just want to have a look at that uh, 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 put you on the spot here and, uh, and ask you to, to work the technology again. Uh, but I'd like to look at that, that particular slide um, that, uh, that had the, the standard on it. And just go back. Let me just... Doesn't matter if people can see me, but they can see you and they can see mm -hmm. me. Um, so the, I think you are referring to this one. Yeah, do you want to put up the, uh, the things along the bottom there? So in terms of the Australian standard, just to, to clarify this, um, uh, the, uh, the Australian standard is set 50 times above um, what, what is actually necessary for it to be set in terms of- well, 50 times below. Below, sorry, 50 times yeah. below. <laughs> and um, when you look at those things, um, there's more EME that's submitted from radio than from mobile phone towers, is that right? Yes, so from this particular study that our PANSA conducted a few years ago, 
uh, the highest amount of EME that we measured was uh, actually coming from radio, not from mobile phones. And just again to say that the mobile, it's not the phones itself, that's the towers or the, or the phones? Um, that's the towers. So um, the towers are 500, the EME that is emitted from the towers, whether it's 5G or 4G, is 500,000 times below the Australian standard, which is 50 times below what is acceptable um, for um, human interaction, effectively. Yeah, 50 times below where we know that a health effect would occur. So mobile phone, it's 500,000 times below where a health effect would occur. Yeah. And this is not based on one study, it's based on lots and lots of studies, peer-reviewed studies, international evidence. No, these figures come from our own study at our Panther. So we did our own survey, um, uh, it's called a Wi-Fi in school study, and we did our own survey. And these figures come from our own study. But what I can tell you is I don't have the figures here, but other uh, studies in other countries have done uh, similar measurements and you'll find that the numbers are very similar below sort of international guideline levels. So it's not that we found this and other um, countries have found something different. Other countries that have uh, done measurement studies similar find that uh, what they measure is well um, below uh, any sort of safety limit that's been set. And can you just go back to your slide on 5G as well? I thought the slides on 5G. Um, This slide, no. Uh, no, I think the, one, the one's towards the end, Paul, I think. Um, this one? Yeah. Um, so 5G is new. Do you want to just say anything about how it's different to 4G? Um, so at the moment, 5G is actually very similar to 4G. So it's operating at a similar uh, frequency of radio wave uh, that 4G operates at. However, in the future, 5G will operate at higher frequencies up to uh, probably about 26 gigahertz in Australia. And um, that's one of the, the main differences. Um, now, what that means in terms of exposure to our bodies. So as the frequency uh, increases from these types of technology, the exposure um, and the way our body interacts with it does change. And the higher the frequency goes up, the less that we absorb into our bodies. So, um, so I guess the lower frequencies from 4G and the previous technologies actually uh, go a little bit deeper into our bodies, whereas the 5G frequencies will mostly be absorbed at the level of our skin and not going any deeper. So in, in I don't know if you'd use these terms, but in some respects 5G is, is safer in terms of less absorption into our bodies. You would say everything is safe, that's what the standards say, but um, 5, 5G will be absorbed less into our bodies than, uh, than 4G is in, at the end. Yeah, so I mean, I don't think there's any evidence to suggest the other technologies aren't safe. So I wouldn't, you know, use the term safer. I think um, they've all, you know, shown to be safe. It's just that um, the, the radiation, you know, is, isn't as absorbed as deeply with the higher frequencies that will be used in the future from 5G. Look, Dr. Loughran, um, on behalf of uh, my community in, uh, in Glenhaven and across the Barara Electric more broadly, and for anybody else who might be watching this, uh, this webinar or watching it later, I just want to thank you for um, making yourself available and for taking the questions that my community has had. Um, it's been very informative um, uh, for everyone, and I'd like to thank you very much for your time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Goodbye.